found it a bit challenging for my learners and therefore I found that I had to do it twice. So I thought maybe I could share more insight into it to assist wherever I can. All right, we're going to start with a poem and get to know more about Dennis Brutus. Is he the poet of our poem today? Dennis Brutus was of a colored descent and he was born in Zimbabwe in 1924 and he died in 2009. He grew up in South Africa and his father worked as a teacher and was active in the fight against apartheid. He was shot by police and imprisoned. His political activism made him very unpopular with the government and he left South Africa for the United Kingdom in the 1960s and taught there at various universities. This is the man that we're talking about today. Um, I'm going to give more in his historical background to help you there. He taught English and Africans at a lot of high schools in South Africa um, after 1948. Um but he was dismissed for his vocal criticism of apartheid. I think we all know that during the time you became vocal as a, um, a teacher, you will be somehow dismissed and silenced. He was banned for his political activities and as such he migrated to Mozambique, but he was arrested when he was in Mozambique and returned to South Africa while trying to escape. That's how he was shot. So he was sent to Robin Island as well for 16 months. And he was in a cell next to Nelson Mandela. Um, after his release, he left South Africa and went to exile in Britain. He was eventually, as apartheid ended, unbanned by the South African government somewhere around um, those times. Um, and he was also circled in Cape Town and all those things. So this is the man that we're talking about today when we're coming to talk about Dennis Brutus. He has a lot of um, the political activism in his background, which is maybe why after um, he released his poems, one of his poems is based on uh, that. We'll go to the historical context of the poem itself now. The poem was written during the apartheid, but it is based on a female nurse called Valencia Majosi. And this is the person that we're going to be talking about, Majombozi, my apologies, Valencia Majombozi. Um, she was an African woman who managed to qualify as a doctor after so much hardships and sacrifice from her parents. Um, after here it says it was written during the apartheid and shortly after the death of a newly qualified doctor Valencia and this poem criticizes oppression um it can be seen as a call to arms do not surrender to the oppressive powers it says so which means it is a protest poem it is also about the frustration of aborted hopes Valencia died before she could work as a doctor but her family had really made enormous sacrifices to get her through medical school, but all those were in vain. I will add on on Valencia Machombozi there. She was an African woman and um, she got a medical degree, but the irony is that when she finished her degree, she died during the Chaparville massacres Therefore, she never got the chance to become a full doctor. Um, our poet went to a funeral, and therefore, this poem's starting point is the funeral of Valencia Majombozi. The poem deals with the sacrifices, just as the parents sacrificed for Valencia to become a, a doctor, so does the poem deal with the sacrifices that people made during the apartheid, but they ended up in nothing. So we are looking at this poem as uh, Valencia Majombozi's death being a symbolism and a call to arms 
uh, to change their situations. So that's what we'll be dealing with when we are coming to the historical context of the poem itself. If we look at the poem when we begin, it says immediately after the title, the title is at a funeral, as we can see there. And then immediately it says, for Valencia Majombozi. So this is where we are now when we're talking about Valencia Majombozi, this one, yes. For Valencia Machombozi, who died shortly after qualifying as a doctor. So that's the historical context of the poem itself. It has a lot of difficult diction. The poem has a lot of difficult diction, as I found out for my learners. So I will be helping you with words, their meanings, as we are going along to try and help you get through the poem itself, because it's a little bit loaded with a lot of symbolic diction. All right, we are going to read our poem before we start. Black gold and green at sunset, pig and tree, and stubbled graves expectant of eternity. In bright white, nuns white veils, the nurses gush their bounty of red wine clocks, frothing the beckled dirging slops. Salute! Then ponder all this hollow panoply for one whose gifts the mud devours with our hopes. Of all, all you frustrate ones, powers tombed in debt, aborted not by death, but carrion books of birth, arise. The brassy shout of freedom stirs our earth. Not death, but death's head tyranny skithers our ground and blots our narrow cells of pain, defeat, and death. Better that we should die than we should lie down. This is the poem that we're dealing with, as I was saying. It is a tribute to Valencia. It is about a funeral ceremony. That's the summary of our poem. The speaker presents the funeral as an occasion to renew his commitment to the struggle for liberation. He does this by comparing the burial, the key word there is comparing, the burial to those people whose lives are being smothered by the oppression. Oppressed people cannot live their lives fully. He urges active resistance. He states that death is a better fate than yielding to defeat and death. This is the summary of the poem that we're doing today, right? Right, we go to the structure of the poem. I'm going to talk about the structure first. Um, right, the poem has two stanzas of the same length, right. equal stanzas, and therefore that forces it to have a specific and a strict rhyme scheme. Our rhyme scheme, I will write it down for you to help you there. Our rhyme scheme is, oh, sorry, must come here. Oh, my apologies. The rhyme scheme of the poem will be, let's go to, back to the poem so that we can look at the rhyme scheme properly. We have page entry and eternity. That is our A. So we have an A there as the rhyme scheme. That's our rhyme scheme that we begin with. So it's an A. 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 And then we have um, the next one is the nurses cash their bounty. That is an A again, learners. Going to go there and put our A as well. We continue. Dedging slops. Our dedging slops becomes a B. We go there to our slops and write B there. And then panel P is an A because it rhymes with bounty. So our rhyme scheme there becomes an A. And then we have um, our hopes. 
that rhymes with slopes. So it becomes a B. That's our rhyme scheme for the first uh, stanza. Let's go to the second stanza. We have dirt and birth. We are starting this one afresh, which means dirt becomes a C. Birth becomes a C because it rhymes with dirt. Earth becomes a C because it rhymes with dirt and birth. And then we have ground, which is a new one, which means it becomes a D. And then we have dearth, which is which is rhyming with um, F. So it's a C. Let's go there to our dearth. It's a C. And then finally, we have light down. Uh, which rhymes with crown. Um, the, right, let's go up a little bit so that we can... Okay. All right. Ground, down, that's the same rhyme scheme, so it's also a D down here. That is our rhyme scheme. So as we said, it has an, a specific and a strict rhyme scheme, which becomes A, 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 B, A, B, um, followed by C, 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 D, C, D. That is the formality of our rhyme scheme, right? We continue there, as we said, uh, strictly rhyme, a strict rhyme scheme, two stanzas of the same length. So what do the formality of the structure symbolize? This is exactly where we are coming in now, there. The formality of the rhyme scheme, it mirrors the formal rites or rituals of a funeral ceremony that is done. That is the uh, symbolism of our a rhyme scheme there. We continue and now go to the poem itself. I'm going to start with the title at a funeral. That's what I'm going to discuss first. Right, the title is a tribute. So we are going to come here and say title there. Our title is a tribute itself. So when we're saying at a funeral, the title is a tribute uh, to Valencia Majombozi. So it makes it very personal. A specific person is referred, and therefore that specific person has a great impact on us as the readers. So now that's why it has that in brackets to give us the additional information for the title that shows it's a tribute because it's starting with four. Four Valencia Majombozi, who died shortly after qualifying as a doctor. That parenthesis that is in the brackets is giving us um, the details of the tribute itself, who is Valencia Machombosi. The title also, it emphasizes that all her dreams and hopes have been destroyed by death. So the title itself now is always going to give a sense of frustration and aborted hopes. Funeral, aborted hopes that's what it symbolizes in the title so as we say it the title this is what it does it makes it very universal now because it said at a funeral it did not say um uh, at her funeral it makes it very impersonal very universal and we are expecting the tone to be said because funerals always give us tears, we cry, we are sad, we are melancholic. But now we knew as we were starting that Valencia Machombozi has died. So it does even give us the sadness that we um, are experiencing because of how she died. So now when it gives us the Valencia Machombozi part for Valencia Machombozi, therefore, it does make it personal. So I'll bring this here down. Right. For Valencia Machombozi is what makes it personal. At a funeral makes it impersonal. So let me do this to help you. At a funeral makes it impersonal as if it's any funeral. But for Valencia Machombozi makes it personal because it talks about a specific person. And therefore that's why now 
the parenthesis that comes in the uh, subheading is going to specify whose funeral it is. That's the title of our, um, our poem. All right, now I'm going to go straight into the poem without wasting any time. Right, we're going to talk about um, pagan tree. Yes, I will start there. Pagan tree means, um, let me go there and help you out. What is pagan tree? Where is pagan tree? Okay, let me go up. Okay. Right, we are here. Pagantry means elaborate. So if, when we're talking of pagantry, we are saying very elaborate. This is the word that we're going to do first. This one. This word. Right. Pagantry means elaborate display or ceremony um i think when we've seen the funerals on television of people who have um contributed a lot to the country they have a very display uh in a, in their funerals that is very elaborate very fancy very formal so when we're talking of peak entry we're talking of an elaborate display or ceremony and that's what it means and then when we're talking about um the next word, I think I will talk about it's doubled, this one. I'm going to talk about doubled. Stubbled means very small. It's actually protruding, sticking out, rough. Those are the words that rhyme, um, that come up from that word in their connotations. So we are starting and say it's black, green, and gold at sunset. Pagan tree. That's line one that we're doing here. Those are the ANC colors. Those are the ANC colors, the black, the gold, and the, uh, where is it? The black, it's a black, green, and gold. Those are the ANC colors. So this, when it opens the poem, we make an assumption that it's going to be a political protest poem because now the poem is both personal and it's political. She did die in the massacres in Chapelville. So those are the things that we have in mind. And then it says, it's sunset. Sunset is a very um, specific diction because it symbolizes the end of a life. When the day ends, it's actually, it's the end of a life. So when we're talking of death, we are using the word sunset in this poem. So pig entry, as I said, it's a ceremonial display, uh, a very elaborate, as I said, that is just for a show because all of that does not matter. What does not matter? When we say all of that, what do we mean? We're talking of this, right? The hopes and dreams are the ones that do not matter anymore because they are lost Valencia's hopes, Valencia's dreams do not matter anymore because she is dead and therefore they are lost. So now when he comes in and says to us, um, black, green and gold at sunset, pig and tree, he starts the poem at a very political level. The resistant moving, movement in South, South Africa has a flag and therefore those colors are for that flag. The choice of those colors is not an accident. And we do understand that um, those colors also have been seen somewhere. Um, the ceremonies of the graduation of um, graduates is black caps and gowns, but always have a, has a gold hood indicating what degree they do. And it can be a science degree, it can be a, a, an arts degree, it can be a, a doctor's degree. So this is where now also we are making a connection with those colors because the gowns that they wear at university when um, graduating has those colors as well. It has well, it has the black caps, it has the gowns, and it has the gold hood. And therefore, comb combination of black, green, and gold is also coming out. Valencia was meant to graduate and become a full doctor. Mm -hmm. So now we're coming in and say, unfortunately, she doesn't do that because at the end of the day, uh, at sunset, she dies. 
So sunset symbolizes death. And now the word sunset creates a very somber mood because it has connotations of sadness. I'll come here. It has connotations of sadness. It has connotations. So it gives the mood, this word, this word will give you the mood. Okay. So this word will give you a very somber mood, a very sad mood because it has connotations of darkness and sadness. And then we continue now. The flag that is now placed as part of the ceremonial display, the peg entry part, we are saying that um, it gives an impression that it's just for a show. All that is done is just for a way of saying it is a ritual, but it doesn't have a meaning. And therefore, it's just for a ritual and nothing else. We got to line two and double graves expectant of eternity as i say it's double as i said um i i defined it and said small sticking out protruding those are the connotations of that word and it says it's the stalks of crops that are left sticking out after a harvest or the remains maybe and therefore this implies that that the graves were in a state of neglect they looked very untidy. They were unkept. They are covered in dead grass stalks, which means no one bothers about it after they are dead. And therefore now that's why they'll be they'll be called stubbled. The graves are given quali qualities of being stubbled. And as such, they are neglected. As I say, they are very untidy. And then we have um, expectant of eternity. This is very ambiguous because... Does it? Do they mean either the dead will remain in their graves for an eternity or do they believe that the afterlife will not end? So now that was very ambiguous to start with. But now what we know is when the word expectant tells us that we will all die, death is inevitable. So it's personification because the graves are given qualities of being expectant. This is personification. When they say stubborn graves, expectant, that's personification. So it's waiting for more. The, the graves are waiting for more bodies. And this emphasizes that the graves are waiting for us to die as we will all die. But now it becomes vague when it says of eternity, as I said, will the dead remain in their graves for eternity or there is an afterlife that will not end. So he left, it, left uh, that statement very ambiguous there. Let's go to what I wrote here. And I said, uh, stubbled is also a metaphor. The gravestones look like uh, short grass. And um, as I said, personification of the graves, they are waiting for the dead bodies will be buried and stay there forever. All hope and life are gone. So for us who are alive, they are gone forever, but we cannot speak for them after they are, they are grave. As I said, it's ambiguous. Is it that their life after life will not end or not? So that's our line one and two. Let's go to line three. In bright white, in bright white, nuns white veils, the nurses gush their bounty. Right. Let's take this up a little bit. It's not an actual bride when they say in bright white. It's just a symbolism of innocence. So the bride is just used as a symbolism as the bride is always doned in white. So it becomes a symbolism of innocence there, as they say. And nurses from the hospitals, uh, remember in South Africa, they were uh, they wore white. And then it talks about the nines white. Uh, and, and therefore we are saying uh, the veils of the nuns cover, as we said, the nurses wear the white uniform, and the veils of the nuns, um, they cover connotations of holiness, purity. That's what the veils signify there. So um, white symbolizes innocence. Veils symbolizes purity, holiness um, for the nuns. And therefore, both the brides and the nuns, they have connotations of um, innocence. And then we have gush. 
their bounty, the nurses gush their bounty. When we say gush, it's to flow out fast. But bounty remains to something in abundance. And now what is flowing out fast and what is given in a generous amount, the grief is what is given is bounty. They are crying, they are grieving the death of an innocent young doctor. And now we're talking about um, how their sorrow is being displayed at the funeral in, in abundance, as I said, bounty is in abundance but it says uh, when we continue of red wine clocks what does the red wine refer to the nurses um, in South Africa wore clocks which were lined with bright red and therefore that's a red wine and that's what they are referring there to and now we come in and say frothing frothing the beckled dating slops frothing is the number of nurses that were there the beggled dedging, uh, it now gives a military funeral of some sort, a funeral song, a dirge is a funeral song. Um, and they say it's lops going up and down, frothing, someone is playing a buckle because it's only done at a military funeral. So this could be um, the slops towards the graveyard as if they are making a noise, the slops are making a noise uh, as it is head through the buckle, which is the uh, carry, carriage for the uh, uh, casket of the body. And now we are saying the slops now, if they are personified as moaning as well, because it says going up and down, frothing the buckle, dedging slops. The slops are given qualities of dedging as they are personified of making a noise, which means the slops are personified as also mourning the young doctor. That's what we mean by that line. And then we continue to the next line. Salute, then ponder all this hollow panel P. Salute is to honor. When we say salute, we're talking of honor. Salute the dead as one will do to a soldier. So salute is a gesture. This is a gesture of respect. There is an exclamation mark, this one punctuation mark. We have an exclamation mark that emphasizes that it is a command. So when they are saying respect, it, they are commanding them to do so. So when they say salute, they are saying it as a command. So this is a command to honor the dead as we honor soldiers, as I said. And then they said, then ponder all this hollow panel P. Panel P is a splendid display, beautiful, a very beautiful display, I will say. It's a very beautiful display, but it is a meaningless ceremony that just has flags and speeches, but doesn't change anything. So now we, we, we are coming in to say, then ponder this word. Then ponder um, all this hollow panopy. Honor, salute the dead. But when you are doing that, please think deeply about the lack of sincerity that is there. So that's what the word ponder means. Contemplate on the implications of this funeral. The funeral that is plenty deep displays but do not mean anything. Think about this deeply and also think about the death. So that's what he's encouraging us to do. He wants us to look further than the display. That's why he uses the word ponder, which is to think deeply. Look further than the flowers. Look further than the people. Look further than the music, he says. So there are th three things he wants us to ponder on. What are they? Um, he wants us to ponder on... Let me go here. Um, music is one of them. Look further than the music. Look further than um, the funeral flowers. That's the second one. Funeral flowers, he says. And then also look further um, than the people as well. The third one is the people. These are the three things that he wants us to look further on. So this one, this one. And this one, 
look further than all these things and think deeply more than what is just there. Because the music, the funeral flowers, the people, it looks like it's a show, but doesn't mean anything. So it lacks sincerity. All these symbolize that it lacks sincerity. That's what is giving us there when he's talking us sincerity is not there. So he says there is no sincerity in this ceremony. The people, the music and the funeral uh, flowers, there's no sincerity. That's why he forces us to think. And then in the next line, he says, for one whose gifts the mud devours with our hopes. When he talks about for one whose gifts, one refers to Valencia. This one, I'll just write V uh, beneath it so that you remember that it stands for Valencia. One is Valencia, whose gifts the mud divorce. The, the gifts refers to a ability. Gifts is a ability as a doctor to heal and bring comfort to others. And then he says, divorce uses beautiful diction, this one. When he says divorce, eat greedily, hungrily, quickly. The mud of a graveyard is now personified again. This is personification again. Is, is compared to a hungry mouth. The, the personification emphasizes that all her hopes and those of her people are now buried in the earth. We are getting a tone of despair, a tone of sadness. So that's what the, that line gives us there. Line six, we are getting a tone of despair and a tone of sadness when the uh, the mud is personified as devouring. We go on to line, um, the, the, the tone also in line five, it's a defiant tone. That's a defiant tone when it says salute and puts the exclamation mark to show the command, which means that's defiance. Ponder, as I said, Com contemplate the implications of this funeral and death in general. He encourages the reader to look further than the display, the funeral flowers, all the people, the sad music, and so forth. And then they are meaningless, he says, hollow. They are hollow, which means there's no sincerity at all. Ponder, the whole display, like sincerity, negative connotation of the earth, as I say, personification, the earth has the ability to devour and consume. Hungry mouth, as I said, divorce, um, mad divorce with our hopes. All her, her is Valencia. Her is Valencia. There is all the people whose hopes are now uh, going to be revived, are now buried in the earth. Right. We go on to the next line. Oh, all you frustrate ones, it says, this is apostrophe. This is a figure of speech that we call apostrophe as he addresses the dead directly. Oh, all you frustrate ones tombed in debt, we call that apostrophe. Direct address, talking about all the people who are frustrated with their oppres uh, oppressive lives, we call that an apostrophe. I hope you can spell it. Let me give it to you if you feel you do not remember the spelling. Right. Yeah, here. Yeah. It's apostrophe. That's the figure of speech. We call it apostrophe. It is when we address the dead directly. I think you did Milton in grade 11. Milton, thou out, live, thou out uh, living at this time. Uh, that's apostrophe. Milton was addressed as if still alive. That's what it does as well. Oh, all you frustrate ones, powers tombed in death, he says. When he says frustrate, I'll I'll focus on the word first, frustrate, this one. Oh, all you frustrate ones. Uh, that word means to prevent the success of something, which means preventing their dreams from being realized. They are powerful enough, actually, those words, when he says power in, powers tombed in death, frustrate ones, those words are powerful enough to bring uh, a ton of frustration in us, um, so as such, they will also frustrate the government in turn and not be passive anymore. The dead are described as powers tombed in debt, in debt. Their potential is buried because of their debts. So that's something that he gives to us, as I said, 
aborted. Their lives have been cut short. He said in line eight, um, ending a life before it has begun. You, we all know coming from the word abortion, when you get pregnant and then you abort the child before you it, it, it develops. That's what we call when he says, ends their life ends before it has begun. But he says, aborted not by death, but by carry on books of birth. Carry on books of birth refers to the past book. Yes, I mentioned it's there. It remains to the past book. Remember the life of a black person. Um, from the moment of birth, you are given a past book so that you can um, cease to be a human being from the point of birth. So now when you are, now your life is to be uh, recorded in a past book, it means that something has been taken away from you. So that's why we are saying that black people are, are dead because their freedom is taken away due to the past book. I say, dear, uh, they are dead not because they died, but because their freedom is taken away with the past book. Their lives are death-like due to oppression. The apartheid government was cruel because um, they had to uh, give a past book that will give you permission to do something, permission to be, permission not to be there, or whatever it is. And that is what we call the oppression. So they are, their lives are not taken by death, but their lives are taken before they can even be, which is by the carry on books of birth, as we said, the, the past books. That's what we mean. Carrion is a rotting flesh of a dead animal. So when he says carrion book and carrion means the rotting death of a of a dead animal, we are already dead before we we are alive. That's what he means. So we continue arise the brassy shout of freedom stares our earth. He says, um. Death, um, before I continue, I, uh, I forgot about the capital letter of the D, this one. Death is given the capital letter D there, and therefore that's personification. We call it personification when the capital letter is given to death there, and therefore that's death is personified. So the books of birth, uh, when we say books of birth, this is an allusion, this one. This one, the figure of speech is an allusion. Yes, the figure of speech is an allusion. That's a figure of speech there for the uh, a books of life, books of birth. That's an allusion. And therefore, we are talking about um, cruel apartheid laws. So that's why we'll call it an allusion because it refers to the uh, apathetic laws. That's what we will mean when we say books of birth. All right, we will continue. It was called the Dompas. I was I was thinking of that name. It was called the Dompas. That's what that was the actual name of the passport. Its name was a Dompas. Yes, it was a Dompas. Does it have a double S? Yeah, it was a dompas. That's what it was. That's the name of the passbook itself. That's why I paused to think about the actual name. So it's an allusion to the dompas. All right. And then we continue to line nine. This poem has so many figures of speech. That's why maybe I'm taking so much time on each and everything. Arise, the brassy shout of freedom stares our earth. Right. The dead are addressed directly and told to arise. They are told to arise as we say it. Before, when we do that, we call it apostrophe, arise, he says. And then we also have, again have the punctuation mark, which is the exclam exclamation mark, to show it's a command again. They are addressed directly to rebel. Arise is referring to them rebelling. They must rebel. That's what this word means, rebel. So that's what this word is referring to. They must rebel. That's a command. The brassy shout of freedom stares our earth. They must rebel against the government. Stand up. Start a revolution. 
So that all that is also a defined tone. As I said here, it's a defined tone. So I've come here and given it to you here, and I said it's a defined tone. The brass's shout of freedom stirs our earth, he says. When he says freedom, it is capitalized. I think you see that to show that it is important to them. Freedom is personified because it's something that they are yearning for. It's a capital letter F, as we say it, and I say it capital letter to show that it is important to them. Brassy, I say it confident and aggressive in a loud way. People are angry. They want freedom. Now, brassy is a music that comes from a brass instrument. A trumpet, I think, is more appropriate when we're talking about that one. So that's how it comes in there. We continue now. So music does not send the dead to their rest, he says, but it actually awakens them. As I said, the brassy shout of freedom stirs our earth. Now we continue on and we say, not death, but death's head Tyranny skith is our crown. Death is personified again for the second time. We talked about it before. Uh, and when we say it, death was um, capitalized and personified. It's personified again. We go on and it says not death. When we say death's head tyranny, um, this is um, a reference um, to... Um, the Nazis, the Nazis are the model for how one should really behave, uh, for example, for the whites. So a scythe was a harvesting tool. It was a harvesting tool that was used to harvest. And then it was also this one, scythe. It was also used to collect the dead. So that's what was used in the Nazis during the World War II. So the, the Nazis are the first one who brought in the issue of how they uh, treated the dead. They used a scythe, which was a harvesting tool, to collect the dead. And therefore, the poet here compares the South African apartheid government to the death head wearing, he says, death head tyranny, scythe is our ground, to the Nazis in World War II. A tyrant is a ruthless and cruel dictator. So death is not destroying South Africa, but death had tyranny is. So sky gives an implication of violence, but now he also says our ground. Violence on our ground. Um, this is talking of the land. When he says our ground is, he's talking of the land. Land for the blacks, excluding people of color. That's what he means there. Let's go to these notes that I just put there for you. As I say, it arises an imperative mode. I've talked about that one. Prasi, I've talked about it. There's our earth. Get the idea that earth is waking up. The people are waking up. It's a call to arms again. Want people to stand up together and fight for their freedom. Death is personified, personified as a clock skeleton carrying a scythe. That's why I'm saying came from the Nazis, the cutting of life. Death's head skull refers to the tyranny of a system that cuts down the lives of black people, both literally and figuratively. Tyranny is the apartheid system. Sky this is to cut something vi violently. And therefore, we come here and say it refers to the tyranny first by nine whites. Again, the idea that it is not death that kills them. They are already dead while living because they do not have any freedom. That's our line 10 there, line 11, and plots our narrow cells of pain, defeat, and death. Plots is a pun. That's what that one is a pun because it's a small piece of land where a grave is dark. So it's dark. So now when plot is a pun because plots comes in two ways. Is it to plan something? Usually something evil, something is revengeful along those lines so now but also plots it is two connotations there that's why we'll call it a plan we are talking of um uh, when we say plot we are talking the first one is land the second one is um plan 
That's why we call it, sorry, sorry, it's on the plan. It's plan, not plants. Um, this one, not plan. Right. I don't write it again and I say it, it is plan, not plant. My apologies there. As I said, um, what the color was my color, the blue one. Right, I'll come back here and say thank you. Right. Okay, I think we are done. Right. When I say it's plan, it's a plan. So when we are coming and talking about um no 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 this is not my color. Um, all right, this is the one when I say it plan. Right. So pan for plot which is um, a small piece of land and plot, which is to plan. So to plot is to make a secret plan to destroy someone or something. In this context, the political system makes plans to contain the black people in narrow cells. These could be prison cells or graves, but plot, as I said, in a pan can be uh, grave sites, which is land. Um, we continue, narrow cells of pain. The prison cells where the prisoners of the apartheid government had been jailed. Um, they were very small, they were very narrow. I think you remember the Robin Island when we're being shown Mandela's grave, um, Mandela's uh, prison cell. My apologies, it was very narrow and very small. Now we have this word that is coming in death this one in death, scarcity, which means scarcity. Things are in short supply, food basic necessities, basic commodities. So what is the poet implying in these lines? Pain, suffering, and death were deliberately, deliberately caused by the apartheid government to the blacks. And that's why he says, we should fight and die than to submit to oppressive powers. So the tone is commanding them. That's why he will say, um, we should not take it lying down. That's what lying down is when he comes there. But now he uses the word we. I think I wanted to comment on the word we. Better that we should lie down. When he says we should lie down, he he for, he for therefore identifies with the struggle of apathy and includes us as well. We should die, then we should lie down, he says. He has used the pronoun we as a, a way to include us in the struggle against apartheid and everyone else who is actually um, going through the same struggles. So he has come to terms with the death of uh, the young doctor. She died. She didn't choose to lie down. She didn't surrender. And therefore the poet says it's better, better that we should die. So she died naturally. She, she didn't lie down surrender and therefore that's why he uses the word better all right the, that's the poem that we're talking about okay i'm going to go now to the tone and the theme i'm going to talk to the tone oh, there are so many theme tones so i'm going to add on to these ones that are there i gave defined tone i think i was talking about the tones as i was moving um, through the lines we also have a tone of anger we also have a tone of frustration. I think you remember when I mentioned um, that it also forces us to be frustrated. There's also a tone of disappointment as well. Um, there's also a tone of dismay. These are the tones that are rising up in the poem. But in stanza one, I'll be specific with stanza one. And I say in stanza one, the tone is calm. The tone is even reverent. Those are the tones in stanza one. In stanza two, I'll be specific as well. 
stanza two, the tone is anger and the tone is contempt. There's a tone of contempt as well. So that's the tone that I'm talking about. I'll also go to the mood at the same time. Let me also go to mood and assist you with the mood in the poem. Mood, what are we having? I think stanza one, if I remember clearly, we have a melancholic mood, sad. I said funerals always give us that, sad also. And also stanza two, when he says salute, um, oh, sorry, stanza two. When he says salute, salute, the instanza too. I think I I need to yeah. Um oh, isn't it coming now? And the along. I think in stanza two, when we're talking about the mood, we are going to talk about um uh stanza two, the mood vengeful. Yeah, there's revenge there. So it will be, yeah, I think stanza two. Let me take this up a little bit. Stanza two, I think it's, um, as I said, this sort of revenge salute and ponder. Um, that will be vengeful, yes. Yes, it's a vengeful mood. So those are the things that are coming on in our mood there. Then theme, I'm also going to talk about the theme. Do I still have space? Okay, I'll write here somewhere. When I'm talking about the, okay, let me bring um, this um, and talk about the themes. Which themes are we having? Oppression, as I said up here. Oppression is one of them. Call to arms is a theme. Um, frustration. Of aborted hopes. Is a theme. And then we also talk about fight against injustice is a theme. against injustice is a theme and then we have desire for freedom is a theme as well all right human sacrifice for a cause is a theme for a cause is a theme as well so these are the things that are coming up in the poem so basically that's our poem that we're dealing with at a funeral and um, I hope it helped a lot as I've done the tone and the theme, uh, the poem itself, um, diction, I, I touched on those words, the historical background and then finally we are done with um, Dennis Brutas who is um, our poet. All right, there are certain questions that it will I will want to touch on before we continue we we end a uh, session that really um you must be able to internalize uh when it comes to this question. There are things, keywords that will be very important for you. For example, if they give a question and say, um, let me write here, words like describe. The tone was like um, discuss uh, the pun. Words like um, comment. On the. punctuation with reference to diction remember we are we are having new poetry so which means all the questions that are coming up 
will be for the first time. We don't have them in the past exam papers. So these are things that I want you to focus on when you are um, revising your poem. Be able to know you can how you can describe the tone, how you can discuss the pun, how you can comment on the punctuation with reference to diction, what are you quoting, make sure you are able to know what you take, you put it in your quotes, you give the connotations, and then you are able to explain. So those are the things I wanted to make you aware of when it comes to this poem. So I think we are done for the day. Um, thank you, grade 12s. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good day, great